Welcome to the round 10 Super Coach Coach podcast. I'm Marcus and I'm back this week with FB Donkey. Welcome back, mate. G'day, mate. I was almost a no-show tonight, buddy. Uh, after I saw the results from the weekend, I was definitely a bit reluctant <laughs> to turn up to the show tonight. I think I've been in front all season of you. And then we had the draw two weeks ago, one point lead last week. And then I think I fell a little bit behind this week. I, I, had, a, I had a good week. Oh, like yeah. I went up in the rankings, but now you're like, yeah, doing pretty well. I'm on fire. I think it was like 5,000th and then in the top 2,000 for the rounds for the last three weeks. So definitely caught on fire the old team. And that's with uh, Rowan Marshall going down with a 43 and Fantasia pulling out a 38. So yeah, reasonably happy with how everything went. Before we get into a proper update though, Mark's Tales from the Road. Where have you been the last two weeks, mate? I don't know whether the Patreon podcast went out last week. We had a bit of internet trouble. It did. It did. I was in Kings we Canyon, made it work. which is very remote, and they had enough internet to get something out. A bit better this time in Alice Springs. Kings Canyon was amazing. Definitely worth the few hours to go out there. The rim walk was just sensational, beautiful viewing. Uh, we are taking a week in Alice Springs at the Big Four, like beautiful caravan park. I was just telling you, we had. Pancake breakfast, we've got a gym here, a pool with a three-story water slide. Kids are loving it. We're literally just doing nothing for a week, just chilling, having some rest and relaxation. You know, this traveling business is pretty difficult, so <laughs> let's take a week off here and there. And heading out to uh, West McDonald Ranges in a few days to go and explore that area. Very exciting, mate. So uh, hopefully the internet connection is all right the next place you went to. That was harrowing. We, we lost you halfway. We were trying to connect back so something would upload back into the internet. I reckon that this is a pretty long time not to talk about who got number one weekly ranking. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we really should have started off with this. Woohoo! Congrats, Khan, the Fitzroy Gorillas, a longtime veteran of our Super Coach Coach community, a community stalwart, very regular on the forums, and has been for, I mean, at this stage, it almost feels like 10, 10 years that or something. Would like that. Probably that's, be a decade, yeah. Yeah, like we've spent a lot of time talking Supercoach together and he's just a genuinely great guy. And I think he's a Supercoach Plus subscriber. So that cash bonus gets doubled. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that. Well done from (laughs) Fitzroy Gorillas. That's number one weekly is a pretty massive effort. I've been playing, what, how many rounds have I played? 500 rounds, 400 rounds of Supercoach and I've never really come top 10, I don't think. So, yeah, massive effort. Huge effort. Very, very exciting stuff. So, uh, huge congrats to uh, Fitzroy Gorillas. Super well-deserved. It's not just this week, but he's had years of consistent performance. Uh, One of our longtime vets that's contributed to our Supercoach League wins uh, the couple of seasons that we took it out. And competition's a bit tighter these days. But, uh, you know, we've had seasons where we had nine of the top 10 leagues overall by the end of the season. And Fitzroy uh, has played a a part in those over the years. So huge shout out to him. We are all super excited for him. Good on him. Rumors, but he's going to get a tattoo. (laughs) Yeah, he said an SCC tattoo. So we'll see how far he takes it. But, no, he was very sweet too. He gave the community a shout out and like i said we've chatted with him for a long time so it's a really good feeling for everyone on the forum which is fantastic uh, and actually bryce uh, made a connection with tim on the herald sun podcast uh, so off the back of uh, fitzroy's great work i'll be showing up on the podcast this week and sharing some tips and advice and really to celebrate and revel in uh, Fitzroy's glory. So I should give him an extra shout out for the love he shared with the community. If they were getting the uh, main expert from this show onto their show, <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't that have been me? Uh, I think you're still blocked by Tim. Yeah, so that's yeah, probably I'm, why. I am. <laughs> Uh, hilarious. All right. I'll I'll uh, I'll try not to stuff us up too bad, mate. And put a good front foot forward. If anyone asks, I won't say you're the brains. <laughs> Just tell Tim to unblock me. Ah, oh, funny. So last week, Mark, I don't know if you heard the show, but we changed up the around the grounds a little bit. So I'm going to start off with our score and then your favorite super coach uh, result and your least favorite super coach result from the weekend. Score 2202, <laughs> season rank 6,300, which pretty good i think i've just been sort of tracking slowly upwards over the course of the year my favorite result was flynn getting 103 so i had to play him on field this week and getting pretty close to gorn was a pretty good result for me rcd coming in with 88 was pretty close to that my least favorite was zach Merritt 
getting tagged by Sarong and only putting out 64. So he's been pretty good this season, Merritt, pretty consistent. And at least the Bombers got the win. Finally won a close one. What about yourself, man? So I had 22.72 for the week, enough for round rank of 1900th, pushed me up just outside the top 5,000, so 5,026th. But importantly, first week ahead of FB Donkey and just... Just chugging along again in ahead. Favorite result from the weekend. Flynn was definitely right up there because there's not many people left that would still be running with Flynn at R2. So obviously huge. Least favorite, Rowan Marshall. 43 and an injury. Really, really hurt. Oh, that's sad, man. Fant- that's really Thanks, sad. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> And Fantasia wouldn't be far behind. 38 was gross. Special nominations, though, or shout-outs to Clayton Oliver as my captain. 140 was great. Uh, I think I called that on last week's Captain's Corner, so I've had a, a few good runs on the Captain's Corner. All right, so this week, Mark, very interesting in terms of rookies. I think a lot of attention is going to be paid on upgrades this week versus rookie downgrades because as was flagged last week, there wasn't just good rookies available last week, but there was looking like there was going to be a dearth of rookies in the upcoming weeks. And this week, I don't know if we're faced with many great downgrade options. Fortunately, a lot of people have cash in bank. I don't, but I guess Rowan Marshall means I'm going to do a side swap. So that's my potential out. If you're looking at a downgrade this week, things are a little bit light on. So before we get into uh, the nitty gritty of upgrading and downgrading, et cetera, we'll start with the injured players as we tend to do each week. And this week we might start with Rowan Marshall. He's out for at least a month is the talk. It's a re-aggravation of the soreness, which we did flag on this show as a reason potentially to hold off on him a little bit. I only basically did it because I was struggling to find an answer to Gorn, but hopefully a lot of people didn't follow suit and most people had Gorn, so I don't think they have, um, which is... <laughs> why he's not getting asked about a heap at the moment. But for those owners with Rowan Marshall, 497,000, he dropped about 30K, but it's not the end of the world. You can still sort of side swap him. I guess the question though is, do you keep just because we're all talking about struggling with trades, struggling with value? Four weeks during this upgrade cadence, is that okay to hold off on and, and upgrade around? Or would you just cash him in? He'll drop further when he comes back on return. So he'll offer up a cheap upgrade down the track as well. What do you think with Rowan? There's a fair few variables there, like what's your bench would be the first one. We're also coming into buys, which makes it really tricky to carry an injured player for all three buys. Um, that potentially exposes you. Potentially, that's good because you don't have to play best 22, but potentially it also exposes you to some donuts there or some lower rookie scores. So my temptation would probably be to trade him. And I think that I would be looking potentially for ways to do Marshall to Gorn in your shoes. Very tempting. The challenge that I have with Marshall to Gorn is that I'd have to pair that with a downgrade elsewhere. And there's not many of those options as we'll get to. No. The other part is also Flynn had a really good game. Uh, I know they lost at the end and you could argue if Mumford was there in their shoes, you know, that's the extra sort of strength in the midfield that would have seen them not give up a lead like that. There's some legitimacy to that. His last five minutes against Essendon were excellent and he played a huge factor in the Giants beating Essendon the week before in the last five minutes. And they lost the game out of the midfield after dominating at the start. The thing is, though, up until the end of the game, he was fantastic. I thought he actually contributed really well and the rest of the team capitulated with him in the second half, but I'm not too sure whether or not he'll continue to get a game. If he continues to get a game, I think I will just want to run him at R2 again for another week. So you don't have Gorn either, right, Mark? No, and so there's no super rush to get Gorn, but his break even is getting towards his average. So you're probably a week early, but over the next week or two, you would think those are going to come a lot closer together. Luke Jackson also out for a couple of weeks, definitely... Uh, advantage for Gorn in this very short term. So the question I have with Gorn is more related to his upcoming run. So you've got Adelaide, Riley O'Brien, you've got Bulldogs, English Sweet, I guess, at the moment. Don't know if Martin gets back in time. Brisbane, McInerney, and then Collingwood with Grundy. And then he's got the round 14 bye which Grundy has as well. So I just wonder, is it worthwhile considering 
maybe just holding off and getting him after the bites. I mean, you also don't have Gorn. I'm sure most of the listeners have turned off because almost everybody else has Gorn. But... <laughs> I think it's a little bit of, and you're right, we probably shouldn't spend too long on this, but it is, it's one of those situations where you take your chances that arise. Like, it's going to be hard to get. If an opportunity arises, you probably take it if it presents. I'll consider how to get in Gorn, which makes the downgrade question a bit more interesting, which we'll get to shortly. All right, let's move off Rowan Marshall. I think consensus is with the chance that the injury will drag longer uh, with the 500k, with the struggle of downgrade options, with the buys coming up, kind of makes sense to move him on. All right, this next question is from Corey Blackledge on Facebook. What do I do with Jack Bowes and Toby Green? So the two other injured players, unfortunately, Corey's been hit by both. Bowes and Green, both with hamstring injuries, I believe. So um, I think the Bowes was both? listed as minor hamstring with potentially one week. I, I haven't seen – the injury list doesn't come out till tomorrow, but that was what I had heard. So that would be a keep. Toby Green, four mm-hmm. weeks. Is is that the same as Marshall? I mean, Green was playing pretty well. We are coming into the mm-hmm. buys. It, it's less of a concern than Marshall's injury, though. Like, you think he has a hammy, he gets better, he comes back, whereas Marshall yep. is more potentially long-term impact and being rested, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Do you treat Green and Marshall the same, or would you be more likely to hold Green? More likely to hold Green, I think, yeah. Stress fracture, like you said, versus hamstring, I think does change the the texture of that conversation a little bit. Be also interesting to weigh up like what your buy situation is like. So he's got the round 12 buy, so he'd naturally miss that anyway. So if he misses round 10 and 11 and then misses – round 12, which he would have naturally, he comes back for round 13 and that gives you four elapsed weeks from when he's done his hammy. So it's actually probably a decent punt to hope that he'll return from after the buzz. And at most he misses round 13 as well. So you've got to evaluate how bad your round 13 situation is. But uh, I suggest most people seem really, really struggling with uh, the round 14 buy situation and round 12 and 13 in general seem quite healthy for most teams. So if you're potentially going to be fine on playables anyway, it cuts to a best 18. Does that give you the added temptation to to hold him? Because even if he does miss round 13, the impact might be somewhat muted. You know, hopefully he just comes back after his buy. You probably don't see him coming back before his bye, but no, it's, it's four weeks is always really, really tricky, right? Like it's it's right on that borderline. I think five weeks is a trade, four weeks probably isn't a trade, but it's really hard not to make that trade, especially when you know you're going to be copying a rookie score for the next four weeks. Yeah, I think that the way you've outlined it means that not a bad idea to keep. He presents a bit of value still. Like you want him in your final team potentially. Yeah, I, I don't hate. That well, I think the main thing is one week gets discounted, right? Because you're going to miss it with a buy anyway. Whereas Rowan Marshall is like, he's a round 14 buy player. So that was always going to be really painful. Rowan could miss the next four and miss round 14, which means it just isn't back until round 15, which is terrible. That is, would be a bad result. Yep, I think that that is the difference. Because if you look at green and it's only three weeks, three weeks is a definite keep. Yeah, well, three weeks minus one that he would have missed anyway. Then you're only paying a two-week penalty, really. All right, let's go on to rookies. Before we talk about potential trade-ins, let's start with Daniel Maserati's question, one of our Patreons, in terms of who to trade out. What do we do with rookies with great job security and decent on-field scoring potential have topped out? Chad Warner, Powell, do we hold them through the buys and cull others such as Berg, Monroe, Cozzy, Scott, etc., or do we cull them now? So we got a few questions about Powell. I think his break evens over 100. Really interesting question. 375k is pretty good for a rookie outside of like some of the best rookies we've seen of all time like michael barlow or something like that like we've generally don't see plus 400k that often but this is generally about the top of what you'd expect what do you reckon about cashing him in now or would you run the gauntlet that he drops in price i mean the worst case is if he has another game in the 40s it's going to take him a bit of time to recover that sort of price point. Uh, around 12 buy, which is definitely a great buy. But then again, if you wanted to trade him out over the buys, you would almost prefer him to be around 14 buy player and then you trade him buy free. Whereas this way, if you keep Tom Powell, you're almost copying a buy with him. 
And you'd be pre- pretty tempted, like, do I run round 13 and 14 with Powell as well? Do I trade him out at that point? Do I trade him out before the round 12? Powell's definitely the tougher one, I think. Chad Warner, for me, potentially is a bit of an easier discussion. He's at 322,000 with a projected score of 61. There's probably no real dramas holding Chad for longer because he also has a round 14 buy. So he's one that you could definitely think about keeping until round 14 or round 13 and then side swapping to a buy free premium. I think Powell's a bit tough. Yeah, it's funny that this is the question that we've got a bit lost on last week with the Patreon podcast with the internet. It was, do you, do you trade these guys? And last week, Powell and Scott were looking great. And my answer was leaning towards, well, I was basically saying you, you trade it once the break even gets high. So you, you keep them until it's not working anymore. And potentially this is the week that it's not working anymore. So the advantage of Powell has been reliable, strong job security, getting games every week and scoring well on field. So you can rely on him on field. There's not a lot of rookies you can do that with this year but he's right in the gun for my team this week i think at 375 it's a really really good return you can trade up to dusty for like fifty thousand. that's a crazy good opportunity i know most people have dusty but that sort of opportunity where you can get a premium for fifty thousand, you should try and make that happen i think so yeah i'm pretty strongly in the category of trading pal don't have warner what you said makes sense. He's not quite so up there in price. That one's probably a little bit more line ball. Was there another rookie you mentioned or was it just those two? I think the other one in the firing line for me is Scott. 286, coming off a His good run. break even still 29 though. Okay. Mm. So not a yeah. forced trade because he did have the good week the week before, but someone that would probably be you, looking at moving on at that price. Yeah, you're happy to cash him in at 286. Like the most he goes up next week has another decent score, 295. You think he tops out not long after that. So more than happy to trade him out at that point. He's 85 in round eight, really giving him the good break even for a while. So I think, yeah, you can hold him on for one week longer. I, I, again, going back to you want to up, be upgrading your players, right? These really good scorers, it's about who can you upgrade and manage a good upgrade from. And so Tom Powell is a great opportunity to pick up a midfielder. So Jack Steele, for example, is a fallen mid this week. It's hard to hit 570, 560, but at the same time, that's a pretty good price for Steele. It's about the lowest he's been all year off the back of one poor score. You know, that's an opportunity with Tom Powell. You trade him up at the high, you trade in Steele at the low. Um, that's kind of the idea. But you don't really want to be trading down, right? So you wouldn't want to trade a Powell and a Warner and go one up, one down from them because you're downgrading one of your on-field spots. So I traded Warner out last week, but... I'm probably a bit unique. Like I actually finished my forward line. Obviously, I got Marshall to deal with, but uh, Zebel, Zorko, Marshall, side bottom, down and Martin. So if I kept Warner, it would have stopped me going after uh, a midfield upgrade because I'd completed my forward line previously, but I could swing Marshall back down. So Warner became surplus to requirements, and I could trade him out. So that's the other way to prioritize. Is also look at you know how many rookies do you have on field and. If you're at a point where you've traded out all the poorest scoring rookies on field, then naturally it's time to cull some of the best ones anyway. So last week I was down to Powell, Jordan, and Flynn. Jordan and Flynn still have low break-evens. Powell now has my highest break-even. So, I mean, I could hold Powell for longer, but it's time I trade Powell out and try and find a premium for him in, in that spot. You only have three rookies on field. Yeah, I've, I've still got Fantasia, obviously, and Danaher. So the team's not fully complete, but in terms of rookies that are started as a rookie, yeah, there's only three left. That's why I'm gunning it, mate. Upgrade coding. <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, let's get to the next question. Bosman's asked, uh, again, one of our patrons, he missed downgrading this week due to kid duties taking priority. I know uh, Mel missed her trades too. Uh, I your wife uh, forgot to trade. Yeah, so a bit sad. Yeah. But luckily, you have the beautiful view of Alice Briggs to keep you very well uh, distracted. So that's fine, I think. But in that situation, we did get a few questions asking, is it too late to jump on RCD and Poulter? And I guess, especially in the context of this week, not having many rookie options. So RCD is now 182,500, 764388. If you saw him being a power type, I guess you could consider it. Generally, very, very apprehensive about bringing anybody in. Caleb Poulter's 174 that, that has had such a big price increase. 
But does this week change things because there's just not the same downgrade options? And I guess the other option is Barnes from the Saints, um, probably the same category. Yep. I think it does, right? So say you're looking for a downgrade this week, what, your two options realistically, or four options, are players that have already played. So Poulter probably wouldn't bring him in just because of iffy job security at that price. Collier Dawkins looked great. Uh, he would be one I'd consider. Bynes, even at 160, like I'd actually consider that. And then there was the Adelaide guy. Was it Rain O'Connor? Scored 47, but only played 50% game time. He's only played one game. And there's not really a whole lot of other options that are cheap. And if you want to keep your upgrade cadence going, right? Like you need to be downgrading and upgrading. And you've got a bunch of players that you don't have a lot of options. So yes, I think that if you're ever going to do it, it's this type of week that I would consider doing it. What about you, mate? I think that, unfortunately, that may be correct. The challenge, I guess, is, so if they're debutantes on this weekend or they're players that have played two games but come back late, they may be late saviors. Like a Lockie Jones is a guy that people are talking about potentially being back to being fit this week. If he comes in, that would definitely be a saviour for some. We have Jones, so it doesn't help us a heap, but he's somebody to consider. You know, another option is taking a guy who you might be going early on. Cody Waitman scored 75. Uh, he was a top draft pick, so he's 173,000. If he gets another game this week, would you consider going early on him? Or because he's then that similarly priced to RCD, do you just go with RCD instead? Tanner Bronze, not done particularly well. He scored 45, being back in the team last week. He's at 162,000. These are guys you're all paying more money for. Otherwise, you'd be saying, all right, do I go with a Ronan O'Connor, like you say, early? 47. Do I go with Kieran Briggs? 42 uh, off a debut. What do you think about that? You know, taking a risk on a debutant versus paying more for RCD. And I guess, does your upgrades almost dictate that? So if you can trade in RCD, but that doesn't net you a premium versus you taking a risk on a debutant and that allowing you to hit a true premium with that downgrade this week, does that help to inform some of your decision making? That's tricky. It's really complicated and tricky. So for me, it's not necessarily the difference between a premium and a not premium. So say in the midfield this week, if I take, so I've got Poulter and RCD, but Bynes would potentially be an option, right? Burns, is it? He, at 160, looks to have decent job security at the Saints. If I take him, then I could get Josh Kelly or Tom Mitchell. But if I took one of the guys off one game, then I could actually get Steele at the cheaper price. And you're looking at quality midfielders and weighing up the quality of the rookies and their future scoring. And so it gets quite complicated and quite dependent on assessments of each player. I'd probably be willing to take one, but not two of the guys that have increased in price already. My history of taking players like Collier Dawkins at 180 is honestly not very good. I don't have a great track record of that working out very well. Sometimes that's because of injury. So like he could get injured next week and then you've just like completely stuffed it up. I guess if you've slept through it because of kids, then I'd be more willing to make a compromise, to be honest, and just take that player a week later. So I guess what happens if you already have some of these downgrade options, right? So we have RCD and Poulter. If you're forced into a situation where you can't even go some of these more expensive players, where does that force you into this week? Because there's really not much you can go for. I think we've covered them. Yeah. And maybe Burns because it's unlikely you'd have all of them. Otherwise, you're talking, you know, paying more for hours, going early on Waitman, going – paying a lot for Tanner Braun when he's actually... And they're the same price as the other guys anyway. Yeah. Do you go early on Ronan O'Connor? I think Brody Kemp is supposed to be a high-rated draft pick. He's supposed to debut on the weekend. You take a completely fresh debutante, completely blind. What are the options? Or is this a week where you might not trade at all if you're in that situation? Or does that change the view on some of these forward line potential, you know, downgrades slash mid prices. Yeah, I guess wondering whether you have any other rookie options otherwise or rookie suggestions or whether you take a risk on any of them. Otherwise, we can get to some of these potentially more fringe forwards. Well, I think we probably need to discuss the fringe forwards independently like or individually to actually get a bit of a feel because I think that 
because of the rookie situation, your risk appetite has to go up a little bit. So not trading is a long way from ideal. And so I'd be more willing to make compromises in my trading than not trading probably just to keep that cadence going. Yeah. And so it then opens the door to other options. So if you don't see money coming in, it opens the door to other potential money-making options like Jesse Hogan, whoever it is, which you make money from trading power to him. Like that sort of trade definitely becomes more palatable given the lack of rookie stocks this week. I'm still debating this myself. I'm pretty reluctant to bring in Burns at 160 or Waitman at 175 off one game. I'm, I'd rather punt on someone like Briggs, who at least if you if they've only played one game, at least their bottom price, like at least you're not paying a premium on it, even though he didn't score very well. So yeah, don't like bring people in off one game unless it was a very good first game. And like, we haven't got any of those guys. Yeah, I agree with that. There's... I don't think there's any players that I'm really happy to take at a more expensive price. Like RCD is probably the only one, but even then he didn't look that great until a superb second half where he was a big part of the clearances that helped them win that game in the end. Um, he was actually struggling a little bit prior to that point. And there's still a stack of midfielders to come back from Richmond. So there's, you know, more medium long-term job security starts to get sketchy at some point as well. So paying 180 is definitely not ideal. I think that just to close out the rookie front I would probably be almost looking to potentially even like a fresh debutant if you you were really forced down that sort of path otherwise considering some DPP flexibility would help as well so Briggs obviously when you're trading opens up our forward backline pivots Finlay McRae if he comes back in because he scored so poorly in the first three games he's only 137k so that may potentially be a little bit more palatable a price bracket yeah but you don't have a a heap there to uh, really go to so let's talk about some of these uh, mid-price forwards then because I think the two that probably stand out this week Jesse Hogan and Isaac Heaney and we did get questions about them so Hogan has played two games. They weren't consecutive because he has had calf complaints and he was looking actually pretty sore in the second half of last week's game. But he scored 92 and then 89 or something like that in the first two games. He kicked four and five. I had him in my super coach team before. He's averaged 93 for a season before. He's averaged close to 100 in a patch. Definitely has the right attributes to go. Uh, that's a pretty tempting uh, mid-price option. He's just above 300K at 310. And GWS are turning their form around a little bit. They were leading Richmond until late in the piece. And I think by expected score, they've actually generated enough good uh, shots on goal to be pretty much a a top eight type team. So even though they're not sitting in the top eight at the moment, they aren't actually playing too bad football. So it's not the worst forward line to be playing in. What do you think about Jesse Hogan before we get into Isaac Heaney? Pretty risky pick. How many games has he played? He played seven last year, 12 the year before, 20 the year before, 10 the year before that. So he's missed a lot of footy in the last six years. The chances of him playing every week would seem pretty low, I would say. There's a lot of injured forwards, though, that you might not mind getting back late in the piece, which is another reason why I was thinking about some of these players. So you've got... Dangerfield to come back at some point, Butters to come back at some point, you know, Rowan Marshall, for example, to come back at some point. There's some players where you wouldn't mind keeping open the last position for a, for a side swap. I don't totally love that plan. Like, I know I know where you're going and stuff, but you, there may be other opportunities with other forwards getting injured that present that and planning around. That's really like a plan D backup plan rather than a, hey, let's go with that as a leading idea. I can see where you're coming that, from if you could use him as a cash cow almost, like a points on field generating yeah. cash cow, not horrible. You're relying on a lot of things to go your way, like playing every week. Like Tex Walker. Yeah, a little bit, but without quite the level of ceiling that Tex had. So Tex had already posted a couple of big hundreds in those first couple of weeks. And I think we recommended the game start at the time. I don't yeah. think that we would be considering Jesse Hogan at all if there were rookies available this week. Yep, yeah, I'd agree with that. Round 12 by is very tempting. Yep. And so I can see why he could work out. I don't know. Like, have you got a different assessment? Uh, I'm basically not sure what I could do without considering him this week without a downgrade option, basically. And the worry is if you go early on a downgrade option, 
you continue to struggle finding downgrade options in the future because you've potentially nixed your downgrade option in a week or two's time. So even if you find a player that you're happy with this week, it feels like you're still pushing that problem down the road until you maybe get lucky and all the rookies show up. But we're hitting the buys in two rounds, so the number of potential rookies that debut each week also go down by a third during the, that period. It's just a challenging spot to be in. So his break even's very low um, at the moment, as you would expect, the break even of five. The challenge is, though, you know, if he has another score in the 70 or another 270s the next two weeks, he only goes up to about 360K. But I guess I've been very happy. Like I've picked Jesse Hogan before in the past as just a full fledged premium. So it's not as though he's a player that. I have not seen going well in the past and he struggled with injuries and some mental health issues or whatever, but on talent alone, if he's getting games, like he's shown in the past that he could deliver some pretty decent scores. I mean, you'd argue like his best career season is better than Tex Walker, right? Yeah. How long ago was that? Was that like in his first two seasons or something? Wasn't he like pretty good for those first couple of years? And then, okay. So for 2018, so Four years ago. Obviously, he struggled a lot with multiple clubs since then. Like, mm-hmm. he's averaged 60, 57 for the previous two seasons and barely got on the park. Yeah, but they need a key position forward, right? It's not like he's playing a secondary role. He's their number one forward when he's playing for them, isn't he? Like, Jeremy Cameron is gone. Yeah, Finlayson, and him, yep. And he's played like their number one forward the last two weeks. Uh, As the number one target, he's fine. I get where you're going, and because of the rookies, these guys do come into consideration for me. It's really hard for me to go, oh, yeah, he's a great pick and recommend him, though, because there's an awful lot of reasons why he's not a good pick. Yeah. So why don't we talk about Heaney quickly? Because Heaney's definitely tempting. He's not bottomed out completely yet, I think. Well, his break even 75, but he still has a 19 in his price cycle which only happened uh, in round seven. And then, of course, he risks round eight. The challenge with Heaney, though, is he's a round 14 by player, which is just pretty chaotic for most teams. So the temptation is if you wanted to use him as a stepladder, you don't have a long time to trade him out. This week he still has a 19 in his price movements, and then you've got three weeks. If you wanted to keep him for the longer term, the round 14 to buy is also painful to stomach. And he has continued injury risk. And even though he scored well at times, he's also had a couple of poor games that potentially weren't entirely injury affected as well. I mean, he did play with a sore hand, but he is still playing in the forward line, which hasn't guaranteed him sort of the top line scores as we saw when he played in the midfield a bit as well. What do you think about him? He's also still a bit more expensive, right? The 340 which at the start of the year, if you had said to me you could get Heaney for 340, I would have thought that is a magic price and I would have definitely taken it. Even playing as a forward, I think 340 is a brilliant price for Heaney. I think that the trickiness comes in with uh, what the quote from Longmire today was, it changes from week to week. He's pulled up pretty well this week. He never does a lot early in the week. Hopefully he will be able to train on Thursday. I don't love that from a guy that's already missed a couple of games this season. So you're getting a discount on price to take on that risk. But he played six games last year, has already missed a couple this year, and has struggled after starting the season really well, except for 110 on the weekends. I am pretty sceptical on Heaney as well, to be honest. Yeah, I almost prefer taking um, Hogan, even from an injury point of view, than Heaney at this rate. Hard to say on that one. I think that they're pretty close. But yeah, you're probably right. Hogan just ticks that box ahead of Heaney, but it's a pretty close goal. And uh, we're coming into the buys and all well and good. You want to get a cheap premium, but they've got to be playing through the next few weeks. And there's no guarantees with either of them, really. But I think especially Heaney. So we're in a challenging spot. We don't have the best mid-price options this week. May's gone up in price a little bit now, so he's 460. Caleb Daniel off 100 and 120 is now at 468. He was awesome on the weekend. Where to? Daniel was fantastic mm. kicking against support on Saturday night and looked like, oh, wow, that's a guy that you want in your team. So, yeah, you sent me the run sheet before the show and I said, mate, they're bloody tricky questions. I'm not totally sure mm. where I stand on a lot of these things because you sort of, you look at the rookies, well, there's none available and 
which leads you to these really highly speculative picks and maybe you get forced into taking one of them and it's hard to really recommend it, but you, you can make that call way so. So, does that mean we might consider for the first time in a long time saying it's not crazy not to trade this week? Because we're all in the same boat. So, if everyone forces through a trade that ends up being poor because they bring in a player that's about to be injured or they bring in a rookie that's going to get dropped anyway, like anybody who double downgraded last week would be probably grinning year to year at the moment. But if you aren't in that situation with a stack of cash, would you consider just not trading this week? That's a tricky one. I'm leaning towards trading anyway, and I'm leaning towards probably taking one of the compromised rookies. So one of the rookies that has already gone up in value. I think that... Do you have RCD and Poulter? Yeah, so probably Burns. So after risk assessing the situation, I feel like that's probably the best play for me because it allows me to get Powell up to a genuine premium. So in my situation, I'm struggling a little bit because I'm going to trade Marshall anyway. And this is where some of these mid-prices look quite tempting. So if I trade out Powell to Jesse Hogan, I can upgrade Marshall to Jack Steele. The other way around, right, because of positions. So it's really... Yeah. So you swap Marshall for Hogan and Power to Steele. So that's a fairly unique situation because you have an injured premium that you're ditching. That seems reasonable. That's so, so that's where it becomes really, really situation-specific into how you risk assess these options. For me, I'm probably looking at Scott and Powell out because I need to generate some cash. Most of my other rookies are either not maxed out, playing on field, or yeah, I just have more cash to come from him. Whereas Scott's sitting on the bench, he's just primed to go. Powell's primed to go as well. I can reach a Kelly type player with that. That's how I would assess the situation. But everyone's going to yeah. be in a So if Hogan player. doesn't really make sense for you. Yeah. Because you'd be side swapping Powell to Hogan, and that doesn't give you enough money to upgrade your other rookie. So, just so that's sort of the context the that you're giving. Yeah. 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 So that's where it's really situation dependent for each team into how the risks yeah. work for your team. Yeah. So if you have no cash, but you have rookies that are ripe to trade out, which I guess most people would at this stage, you'd find it hard to see yourself in a situation where you don't trade at all. It's definitely a game. Like in my situation, for example, you wouldn't consider just not trading? Uh, no, I think that in your situation, I'd be trading Marshall at minimum. So, the, But maybe not using the second trade. You're probably the expert on upgrade cadence, mate. Um, what do you think? I think, to your point, it feels like you're better off taking the risk that the trading target will work because it's a position. And the not position is a position that I keep Tom Powell and he doesn't really have a lot to go from here. So you feel so, like... Yeah, it's really challenging. It's one of the toughest weeks we've had in a while. I don't know if there's clear advice, to be honest. So basically your advice is, what are we coming into round... Is this round 10? Yeah. That your advice would be, you should always max trade coming into round 10, no matter what the situation is. Not necessarily, but almost to an extent, because if you can find a player to take a position on, do you just not give that a shot? So the other option is rather than taking Hogan, I could take maybe a Caleb Daniel at 4.30 and then find another player at about four mid 400s that I like. So that's two compromises. So what if you could pick up Daniel and Dustin Martin this week? Yeah, that seems good. Right? So that's what I mean. Like you should be trying to, I think, find one of these fallen premiums to take a position on because not taking a position means that you hold Powell and you know Powell eventually needs to go. So even taking a position on Burns is all right because you're hoping that Burns will still go up in price and continue to get games. The challenge with not taking a position at all is if everybody takes a position, one of those positions will be correct. And so you're just inherently going to be behind whoever's taken the punt and got lucky with that punt. So if you want to win the 50K, don't you have to take a punt? Unless you are that sure that all the punts out there, like all your permutations, you are so off the risk that they present that you're just like, no, nah, I refuse to take an expensive rookie. I refuse to take a mid-pricer that's compromised. I refuse to take a cheap premium. 
if you somehow have all the permutations so that you have Martin, you have Daniel, you have Poulter, you have RCD, you have, if you run out of those options and you hate Hogan, then like, yeah, maybe you don't trade. But I kind of feel that there's always some position to eke out where it'd be hard not to trade while we're in the middle of upgrading at the moment. At least trying to find a step louder player like a Tex Walker or whatever else. Because at any point in the season, there's upgrades and there's value to be found. It's just that we're all skewed toward looking at the high performers that we generally don't see the guys who are just turning the corner, right? Yeah, true. And this is a year where the turning the corner guys are more relevant than any other year, I would potentially say. It's interesting you said that this is one of the toughest weeks we've faced. I think that... I feel like we've said that coming onto the podcast a lot this year, definitely more mm. than any other season. Like it's week after week of like really brutal decision making. So yeah, it's been a really, really tricky year so far. And I saw someone post today that they were looking at Hogan and Heaney to come into their side. And, and I mean, I could make that work like Scott and Powell out for Hogan and Heaney. Like that's two rookies for two potential premiums. And when what you were saying, mm. that taking a position is better than not taking a position because someone could make that move and it could work out unbelievably well and they could have two full-blown premiums in their side for two rookies that they've just side swapped it comes down to risk assessment and what are the chances of that actually playing out but generally agree with what you're saying that in almost all cases i would be trading this week unless your goal was league yeah if your goal is league this week is actually a pretty good way to just take the week off actually it's you can scrap the last to however long this podcast has gone for no need to listen turn it off you don't need to hear the rest just a couple of call outs before we wrap the show because I think we've actually gone long enough and that conversation's really arranged because it hasn't been a tough week. Dusty Martin, if you don't have him, uh, he's bottomed out this week, 425,000. Uh, I think they commented or Hardwick commented that he looks good after the freshen up. Uh, apparently, he was carrying something prior to that and he came out and scored 121 and was a bit of the difference maker in that game against GWS. So don't forget to look out for him. And yeah, we'll probably leave the rest for the Patreon. Uh, we had some questions around, is it worth paying for Guthrie, Lines, Bont? Quite a few people looking at those top end premiums and going, is that just uh, an eight round patch or is that sustainable? Uh, we'll tackle that in that show. Tom Mitchell versus Josh Kelly types. And is Sam Doherty a uh, guy back to uh, top six best? Uh, Mark's very happy riding him all year. He was uh, in our Patreon picker at the start of the year. So he's been a great get so far. So we cover that in the Patreon bonus uh, that it's been long enough for the main show, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for coming on and uh, all the best to our community. Another big shout out to Fitzroy yeah. Gorillas after his number one performance. Pow, pow, pow. <laughs> And uh, if you listen to, (laughs) after a number one weekly prize, maybe it should be the chicken dance because it's the KSC comp. And uh, for those of you who listen to Herald Sun podcast, uh, we'll we'll catch you on that shortly. And if you want to check out Marcus's impression of the chicken dance, check us out on YouTube. Definitely worth it. (laughs) See ya. ya.